Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 through 12. Last week we did Deuteronomy chapter 33, and the conclusion was, Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. It was part of Moses' blessing for the people of Israel. And happy are you, that word happy can be also translated as blessed. And who is like you, a people saved by the Lord? It's a rhetorical question, not asking for the answer. That means there's no one like you. You are saved by the Lord, and you're supposed to be happy because you are blessed. And this is the last chapter of Deuteronomy, and we want to look at Moses' life as the servant of the Lord. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab. After he blessed Israel, he went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, and the Lord showed him all the land as far as Zoar. And this is the view. If you have a chance to go to the Holy Land, there is always a place to visit based on what biblical accounts is associated with. This is one of those places. If you look at here, there's a Jericho. From this direction on, you can see Jericho from the Mount Nebo. So the covenant part is very important. What happened was God said, I'll let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. That was one thing that we mentioned in prior uh, verses. And he said, I'll give it to your offspring. In addition to letting you to see the land, I want to remind you about the promise that I made with your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is very significant because from our humanistic point of view and today's point of view, to seeing the land without going there sounds like a really sad situation. But for Moses, we don't know for sure, it doesn't say it here. From Moses' point of view, he may have this huge comfort from the Lord, even though he could not go to the land. Because if you look at Genesis chapter 13, the Lord said to Abram, before he changed to Abraham, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are and all the land that you see, I'll give to you and to your offspring forever. What happened here? Abraham never had a full possession of this promised land, but he heard this from the Lord, his promise, the covenant from the Lord, and believed in it. So, knowing that account, having a chance to see the land, and reminded by God's promise, Moses must have this assurance of God's providence towards Israel. And according to the word of the Lord, Moses died, and God buried him in the valley and the land of Moab, opposite Beth Poor, but no one knows the place of his burial to this day. God somehow decided to remove all the traits of Moses, because even though God appointed Joshua as the next generation leader, Israelites most likely would come back to Moses' burial place if they knew. If God did not take Moses' life away at this point, if he was alive and going into the Promised Land, even though Joshua was the new leader, Israelites most likely would have followed Moses instead, given their rebellious nature. Why did he not make it to the Promised Land? It's captured in Numbers. It says, and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. Instead of speaking to the rock, you hit the rock because you were angry about those people. 
But that was not what I wanted. That's what God said. Because you did not obey my commandment. That's why you did not make it to the promised land. And all those good works, faithfully serving God, with one mistake, they could not make it to the promised land. So, was Moses failed to really serve as the servant of the Lord? Let's not go there, because this passage says clearly, Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there. Even though he failed to go to the promised land, he is still the servant of the Lord. So, going there, not going there, was not a determining factor about Moses being the servant of the Lord. If we apply that to our own lives, the worldly success is not a measure for us to be a Christian. Are you a good Christian? Are you successful in this world or not? That's not where or how we see the Christians. So if you go through some difficult times, you're not being successful as other people in this world, please do not be discouraged. If you have the assurance of salvation, if you truly walk in the light based on the scriptures and prayer, then you are God's people. That means God has a different measure, just like Moses. He's not going to allow us to have everything we want. He will provide us with what we need for His ministry, and He will use us for the glory of God. First says, Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was undimmed, and his vigor unabated. So he was a very strong person at the age of 120, until he passed away. He was physically healthy. And many people may think about this as, okay, why don't you continue serve the Lord then? Why don't you do this? But we have to learn a very important lesson from this passage. It's the Lord who provided everything for Moses. Because I'm healthy, because you have money, that doesn't really qualify us to serve the Lord. The Lord provides everything. So the expression that the Lord will provide that appears in Genesis chapter 22 can also mean the Lord will see. So providing the Hebrew word Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide, it can also mean the Lord will see. With that, if you look at Moses' life, we can see it from two different ways logical point of view or humanistic point of view as long as i'm healthy i'll continue to serve or i continue to do this that's what people usually think but our spiritual mind and the bible says otherwise if the lord is willing he or she will be able to serve there's a huge difference between these two perspectives and if we apply that to our own lives as a believer, we have to acknowledge that God has been leading us. He has been providing us and safeguarding us up to this point. If you look back at your life up to this point, you've accomplished some good things. Sometimes you did not accomplish what you wanted to accomplish. Basically, God did not allow that to happen in your life. But we have to remember, as long as God allows us to serve Him, and He will provide what we need. Moses never asked about, can you give me this, can you give me that? He never asked for it. God provided everything for him to serve the Lord by serving the people of Israel. So until he passed away, he had this physical strength that the Lord has provided. At this point, we have to think about this. Two questions to ask. First one is, where am I in my life's journey? 
Whether you're 14 years old or 50 years old, it does not matter. If God is willing, then you have to have this different purpose in your life. Instead of taking one day at a time, not doing anything or wasting your time. Once you realize that, the next question to ask is, how then shall I live? That's a very important question because the moment you realize this, your direction will change. If somebody just stays where he is or she is for many, many decades, well, I'm not going to think about this, then they will stay here. But if you say, okay, I was going with that direction, but somehow at a certain point, I changed my direction because I asked these questions and realized that I need to serve the Lord. I need to walk in the light. Then you're going to make a little difference. Initially, you're not going to see much difference. But as time goes by, the gap between these two people will widen. Where do you stand? Option A and option B. What kind of lifestyle do you actually pursue at this point? Then one of the reasons why you have to think about these questions seriously is because Jesus told us in Matthew this way, therefore stay awake for because you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. We have to remember this in conjunction with this verse. Every beginning has an end. Even though Moses lived for 120 years, his life ended on this earth. You can be 10, 15, 20, older. We have ending on this earth. A lot of times we don't want to think about that, but it will surely come. However, people in this world will be skeptical about our perspective. In 2 Peter, it says this, Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, Where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Sun rises from the east, sun sets to the west, and it's been happening forever and ever. Nothing has changed. But you guys are talking about the Bible and Jesus coming back in the second time. And where is that promise? The scoffers, the skeptics, they will be critical of our belief because they want to follow their own sinful desires. But we're different. We're supposed to believe in what the Bible says. And Revelation chapter 22 says this, And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Revelation was written in the first century AD. It's about 92 in 95 AD. So basically it was written about 2,000 years ago. And Jesus said, I'm coming soon. So for them, the first audience who read this letter, book of Revelation, they thought, okay, Christ is coming soon, so we got to be awake spiritually and wait for His coming. It's been 2,000 years. And of course, scoffers and skeptics will say, where are those promises, guys? I don't see any changes. But if you continue reading the rest of the passage in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says, For the Lord, a thousand years is like a day. A day is like a thousand years. For us, 2,000 years is a long time. However, for the Lord, it can be a split second. He can come anytime. We don't even know when He's going to come. In our time, it could be 500 years from now, 2,000 years from now. Who knows? But we have to hold on to His promise. He's coming soon. 
that's a two different perspective. The world may be skeptical, but the word says what we are supposed to be believing in. So the last few verses of Deuteronomy chapter 34 says this, And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses. There's no one like Moses after his death. Because the Lord knew Moses face to face, and he performed all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt, and in the sight of all Israel. Amazing prophet. And as a result, go back to verses 8 and 9, people wept. The first bullet point. And let's go to the second bullet point first. Joshua took over the leadership role. So the people of Israel obeyed him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. It's kind of interesting statement because based on the 40 years of life in the wilderness, Israelites did not really obey to Moses very well. But the Bible says they obeyed Joshua. Going back to the first bullet point, and the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. The people of Israel, unfortunately, they only had Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. They did not have the entire Bible like we do today. So all they had was this sadness of letting their leaders go away. They wept for 30 days. But since we have the entire complete Word of God, we see a little differently about Moses' departure here. In Matthew chapter 17, it says, And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. It's a transfiguration account of Jesus. And Moses and Elijah appeared at that moment and talking with Jesus. What a glorious moment. What a glorious moment that is. So as we see this one, we have to remember if there's a beginning, there's an end. And Moses' end, his life ended on this earth at that time, but that was the beginning of the new chapter of his eternal journey. As part of it, he appeared in the transfiguration um, account in the New Testament. So, we've been studying the Deuteronomy up to this point, and today's our conclusion. Let's, vi let's consider this passage from Hebrews chapter 3. It says, For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. The fact that it's in parentheses, it means some manuscripts don't have this portion. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant. So Moses was faithful as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. Moses was faithful as a servant, while Christ is faithful as a son of God. Completely different position here and different roles. And it describes that we are his house. We are God's house, if indeed if we hold fast our if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope basically if you believe in Christ then we are God's house that Moses was faithful to and the Christ is ruling over it's an amazing promise it was 
Hebrews chapter three verses four and six. Let's continue. Seven through nine. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me. To the test and saw my works for forty years. The rebellious people, even though they were getting the message from the Lord through Moses for forty years, so he says, "Don't harden yourself or your hearts." I said this before, but the entire theme of Deuteronomy is the gospel according to Moses. Just like gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just four gospel accounts in the New Testament. Why do we call it as gospel? Gospel means good news, and they're asking you to be repentant and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Then you'll be saved. Here. The fitting conclusion of Deuteronomy, it says, "I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life, that you and your offspring may live." And it continues, "If you choose life, what will show through your life? Loving the Lord your God." Obeying His voice and holding fast to Him, for He is your life. As a regenerate person, we continue loving, obeying, and holding fast the Lord. That's an ongoing thing. It's an ing, right? Loving the Lord your God, obeying His voice, and holding fast to Him. Let me give you one example before I conclude this sermon. When you receive the blood test result, and doctor says, "Okay, your cholesterol level is really high, so you have to avoid eating、uh, fatty food, red meat, for example." Then you will stop eating them or reduce the intake of those food group. If you're a conscientious person, then you will do so. Just like that, if you're a spiritually discerning person, we will continue to love, obey, and hold fast the Lord, because it's about our life. It's a life or death situation. When the Lord says, "Choose life," and loving, obeying, and holding fast to Him, if you're a spiritually discerning person. You will keep this word in your heart and practice in your life, because God, our Lord, is our very life.